Then came the words and images of the celebrations that followed. I became almost physically ill, and after attempting to express my distress to my deeply empathetic companion, I began to write these words. Mm. Dear Martin, we hear you again, wisely, lovingly, warning us that the triumph of militarism leads surely to the defeat of humanism and democracy, Amen. to the loss of soul. The CNN anchor, was it Brother Don Lemon, calls this time of the killing as, quote, the president's finest yeah. night. Oh, beloved Barack, are the brutalized crowds mocking you when they gather in front of the White House and chant, USA, yes we can. Have we, you and us, now created a more just and compassionate nation, a more perfect union? Have we, you and us, contributed to the building of a new world that takes us beyond the ancient bloody goals of retribution, of killing for killing, of destroying our enemies? My beloved younger brother, son, what are you teaching the nation, this very needy nation? I feel something deeply tragic in all of this. I am ter terribly saddened to hear that the keepers of conventional wisdom are praising you for your, quote, gutsy decision to return evil for evil. What are we teaching our children, my dear son? What is the lesson for all the young men of the black and brown street communities? Could it be that our first president of color shows us how to deal with our enemies, demonstrates what it means to have guts? Will you now glory in this victory? And what are the lessons here concerning what victory really means and how it is achieved? And where do you think Jesus was? Where do you think Gandhi was? Where do you think Fannie Lou and Martin were when you went forward locking arms and steps with your, our, quote, intelligence community not even suggesting, as you sometimes sadly do, that some evils are necessary, but instead apparently rejoicing and accepting praise for your gutsy decision to render an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, a death for many deaths. What is the message to the young boys, dear brother? Could those millions of young men, and increasingly numbers of their sisters, in our schools, in our homes, in our prisons, possibly think that our president really believes that you're a punk if you don't destroy your enemies by any means necessary. Dear Brother Commander-in-Chief, we now need you more to be teacher-in-chief. We need you to teach the children that vigilante action is not the pathway to humane democratic development as a nation or as individual citizens. Now that you have proven to somebody or the other that you are capable of being commander, we need you, the children and the adults need you to offer guidance Essentially, I'm, I'm telling a story of how the bombing of the Birmingham church affected two of the great nonviolent teachers in the movement, James and Diane Nash Bevel. Uh, 
and the conversation that we had about how they had responded to that bombing. By the time that we talked about it, both the Hardings and the Bevels had left Birmingham, but we knew that the 16th Street Church had been the primary rallying place for the victorious forces of the movement. And we remembered the insistent, enthusiastic presence of the children and young people among us, and the great enthusiasm with which they had marched out of that building to face the police and the dogs, the high-powered fire hoses, and the jails awaiting them. But it wasn't until years after the bombing, after both Rosemary and Jim had gone on their way beyond this life, that Diane told me the story of the way she and Bevel had initially responded to the horrific news of the terrorist bombing and the death of the four Sunday school girls. I pass the story on to you with loving concern and unvanquished hope. Diane said that she and Bevel were visiting with another freedom worker in another state when the word of the bombing and the deaths reached them. Those were two of the most creative, courageous, and committed practitioners of nonviolent struggle in the freedom movement. And I still remember the deep expression of pain that covered Diane's face and filled her voice as she told me of their immediate response to the news of the bombing. It almost literally knocked them off center. And they first began talking and making plans to return to Alabama and give themselves totally to the task of discovering who had committed this atrocious crime and track them down to personally make sure that they would never live to do such an act again. They were determined to seek retributive justice. Then as they talked and planned, Dan said it was as if they suddenly came to themselves and remembered who they were and what their work really was. Gradually, they realized that they were in danger of being sucked into the very terror that they despised. They heard Gandhi and Jesus. They heard Fannie Lou Hamer, Jim Lawson, and Martin King. They heard the wisdom in their own hearts and knew that the best way for them to be faithful to the teachers, to their comrades, to their movement, to those four young girls and to themselves was to take the fire burning within them and redirect it to an even more fierce determination to return to Alabama. Only this time, they knew that they should go to Selma where the courageous black citizens of that deeply racist city were currently working with the indomitable friends and co-workers of Diane and Jim and the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, working together across generations, SNCC and the Selma folks were challenging all the legal and illegal, all the internal and external barriers to black participation in the right to vote. Risking their lives to challenge white supremacy the Selma Voter Education Registration Movement was eager to have veterans, like young veterans like Diane and Jim join them. Eventually, of course, Dr. King would also come to stand with the local forces. As they wrestled to formulate their best response to the Birmingham terror, Diane remembered she and Jim finally decided that the response to white terrorism that would be most fully in keeping with their own deepest convictions would be to work tirelessly in Selma and elsewhere to help place the power of the vote so fully and firmly in the hands of the black citizens of Alabama that they would create a new reality, a new setting in which such terror would never find a place again. Missing a page. Or I'm missing a page, but let me see if I can find it before I give up. But essentially, this this is the 
big message that I was trying to share, taking the example of the Bevels, who were clear eventually that the returning of the Evo was not the way, and the building of a new alternative was the way. And it was as a result of what they did in that building of the black right to vote that no Obama was possible. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. he needed to understand that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If they had yeah. made that choice, yeah. he yeah. might right. not be there now. Mm -hmm. Right. That's right. Wow. right. 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 So you sent That's the letter? Yes, I sent it, but you did. It, um, the major purpose for me was to get it out of me and to mm -hmm. find a way to at least make it available if it, he ever looked at such things. My friend Jim Wallace at Sojourners has a couple of folks there at the White House who sometimes are helpful to him in getting things mm. to our president, so that was the way it went. Mm. But my emphasis as an obsessive <coughs> democracy lover is to keep challenging us mm -hmm, mm -hmm. that the president will be challenged as we are challenged. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. Just as Johnson was challenged by the people going to Selma mm -hmm. when he said that he just couldn't get that bill through, he was sorry, the mm -hmm. people went and risked their lives. Mm -hmm. And yeah. then there was nothing else for him to do. Mm -hmm. <coughs> so I think that we've got to find more ways to challenge ourselves. One, I had another question that, in part based on the letter, um, you said it illustrated something of it, but the, Tolstoy once is quoted as saying, at least as, uh, everything I understand, I understand because I love. Mm -hmm. And I, when I heard that quote, I thought, you know, for the first time that love is a methodology for learning. Mm -hmm. And I, I think this letter, demonstrates some of the methodology of love for learning and, and certainly Dr. King's life and what you've related to us has. But I don't, I haven't been able to articulate that thought in any complete sense of how love is a methodology for learning. Give yourself time and be patient. Mm. Well, I will, but I was hoping for some help time. along the way. You want to know right now, don't you? <laughs> Any insight into the process? Like if I believe it, I want to understand it. Any, <laughs> any glimmer of pushing me in the right direction? <laughs> Appreciate it. Well, you just did. You did? <laughs> yeah, did you hear him? Mm -hmm. I did. Yeah. Patience, I did. brother. Patience. But you know, in the current of nonviolence, uh. you're just saying about Tolstoy talking about love, and it's really Tolstoy seemingly who brought the, the idea of the Beatitudes and the primacy of love to, to uh, Gandhi. And Gandhi said this is the most beautiful way of nonviolence ever created. And, that, and the Gandhian king, now that you talk about some king, king and Gandhi nonviolence, and it all kind of comes into a stream, and that's supposed to be hitting us today, as you say yourself, Dr. Blake. Party, but not bad. Oh.